just just waiting for it to go live. I right hear we are live. So hello to you all across the world. I'm Molly Rosenberg and I'm director of the Royal Society of Literature and we are delighted to be partnering with our friends Lit Hub today to bring you this live conversation between Michael Imperioli, author of this book, and Ocean Vuong, author of this book. This conversation forms part of our RSL 200 Literature Matters series, our bicentenary event series bringing together some of the world's best known writers, thinkers and artists to explore the impact of literature on their lives. Previous pairings have included Marlon James and Neil Gaiman, Gillian Anderson and Andrew O'Hagan, Bernadine Evaristo and Britt Bennett, Stephen Fry and Shappy Corsandi, Fiona Shaw and Patrick McCabe and David Mitchell and Brian Eno. So we are honoured to have this as a pairing to add to that extraordinary roster. For those of you who are new to us, the RSL is a charity led by writers that celebrates writing of all kinds and supports writers and readers at every stage. We work with schools and in prisons because everyone should have access to books. We celebrate the achievements of authors and we provide writers at all stages of their careers with the tools and resources they need to write. And very, very most importantly, maybe, we give readers access to the best writers from around the world, not least through our regular online and hybrid events like this one. Be sure to sign up to our newsletter to find out more about what we've got coming up and how you can get involved. Uh, our newsletter you can should be able to get through uh, rsliterature.org. Back to our conversation today, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers, Michael Imperioli and Ocean Fuong. They'll be in conversation for around 45 minutes, followed by a short audience Q&A, when I'll be joining Michael and Ocean back on screen to ask some of the questions you've sent to us in advance, and thank you for doing that. Both Michael and Ocean published their debut novels in recent years. The Perfume Burned His Eyes and On Earth We Are Briefly Gorgeous. I'm going to show you them again to tempt slash force you to buy them if you have not already. Uh, they'll discuss the experience of writing and releasing novels when you're known for other art forms, as well as the overlapping themes in both of their work, from coming of age stories to mother figures to violence to vulnerability. I can't imagine your impatience, but I'm going to keep you waiting just a little bit longer while I introduce these two writers. Michael Imperioli is best known for his starring role as Christopher Moltisanti in the acclaimed TV series The Sopranos, which earned him a Best Supporting Actor Emmy Award. And he plays a lead role on season two of HBO's The White Lotus. He wrote five episodes of The Sopranos, including my personal favourites, uh, was co-screenwriter of the film Summer of Sam, directed by Spike Lee, and was anthologised in The Nicotine Chronicles, edited by Lee Child. Michael has appeared in six of Spike Lee's films and has also acted in films by Michael Scorsese, Abel Ferreira, Walter Hill, Peter Jackson and The Hughes Brothers. He co-hosted the Rewatch podcast, Talking Sopranos, with his Sopranos co-star, Steve Schripper, who, with whom he also penned the best-selling book, Woke Up This Morning, The Definitive Oral History of the Sopranos. Additionally, Michael is a singer and guitarist in the band Zopa. Ocean Vuong is the author of the New York Times best-selling poetry collection, Time is a Mother, and the New York Times best-selling novel, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, which has been translated into 37 languages. A recipient of a 2019 MacArthur Genius Grant, he is also the author of the critically acclaimed poetry collection, Night Sky with Exit Wounds, a New York Times top 10 book of 2016, winner of the T.S. Eliot Prize in the UK, the Whiting Award, the Tom Gunn Award and the Forward Prize for Best First Collection. Born in Saigon, Vietnam and raised in Hartford, Connecticut in a working class family of nail salon and factory labourers, he currently lives in Northampton, Massachusetts and serves as a tenured professor in the Creative Writing MFA programme at NYU. Before I hand over to Michael and Ocean, I'd like to say a special thank you this evening to our events and partnerships manager, Lily Blacksell, who has made tonight possible and who is working her last event with the RSL today. I'm sure, Lily, you've got hundreds of people across the world thanking you for making tonight possible, and I join them. 
Um, what is that I can hear? Is it rapturous applause and shouts for me to get off the screen? Okay, please join me here now in welcoming Michael Imperioli and Ocean Vuong. Thank you, Molly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good to meet you, Michael, albeit um, we're in the same time zone, I believe. I'm in Massachusetts, just a little north of where you are in New York. I'm in New York, but it's a it's a pleasure and an honor to do to meet you and to do this with you. Um, to, uh, been a, a huge fan since I read uh, the the novel, and then got turned on to your poetry shortly after that, and um, and I reread it uh, in preparation for today, which was um, an equally joyous um, to revisit it. So um, and I'm really happy to talk to you today. Oh, thank you. And and yeah, I've, I've been so, uh, been such a delight diving into your world, this 1970s New York, a, a story of factors in, and uh, I actually lived in a story for about five years um, on 31st and uh, 35th Street, 31st Avenue. So Steinway, Broadway, very familiar with those haunts. So it was really nice to see this voice. Um, it, well, what a delight, you know, to see such an accomplished book um, debut uh, after you've done the things that you've done and I'm just right out of the bat as just another artist I'm like how did you do it um, why now and um, I mean I, I also just learned that you're in a band so I guess uh, this is just the polymath is the, is the norm for you here you know when I when I was a teenager and I came to New York City in the early 80s the downtown scene which I immediately gravitated towards it, it it was a lot of cross pollination between film poetry uh music punk rock post punk no wave um performance art theater a lot of the artists moved very fluidly in and out of those mediums and so uh, among my little circle of friends that was the case like the uh, i I met a friend, uh, Tom Gilroy, in acting class when I was a teenager, and we started an experimental theater company, a more an improv company, started a band together, um, and was you know trying to get work in film and, and television at the same time. So right from the beat, and that was really early on, there was that, and he started doing performance art, and I would kind of run the lights we you know build sets whatever um we started a band together as i said so right from the beginning there was that it it, it wasn't like oh i did acting now i want to try something new it was right from the beginning there was always a lot of that kind of movement between mediums and and you know as you get older um you know uh, literature is a m one of my great loves really you know um i spend an awful lot of time i'm a compulsive book buyer yeah. uh, I, I and and compulsive reader and um over the years it just became more and more important and there were a, a bunch of attempts at getting a series made an original idea several you know that i took to networks and studios at various stages that i sold but never got on the air and I was very frustrated with the process of that. And I like the idea of being able to do something where the, because uh, when you write a screenplay uh, or a teleplay or even the, the Bible for a series, it's a, it's a blueprint. It's not a work of art. It's not a work of literature at all. It doesn't, you know, it's a blueprint. It's a schematic. Once you make the, the, the film, you th it's worthless, you know? So, uh, the idea of the words being the end result, you know what I mean? That was it. There was no one else that needed to get involved, except, of course, a publisher, and you know, which which I was lucky enough to find a good one, Akashic Books. But I like the idea of that being the end result and not having to have producers and executives greenlighting things like that. Um, so that's that's really how that came. You know, uh, I st I had a lot of attempts at fiction before this that were just awful like there's a there's a passage in your book that i want to bring up when i first started writing i hated myself for being so uncertain 
about images, clauses, ideas, even the pen or journal I used. Everything I wrote began with maybe and perhaps and ended with I think or I believe, but my doubt is everywhere, Ma. I told that I completely related to. Um, that was me for a very long time. Yeah. Um, I think we don't have to, you know, find one way or another. I think the doubt is the energy. I mean, actually, you know, the the more I do this, uh, do it for 15 years now, and it, it seems like just a flash in the pan. And uh, when I first started, I could have told folks, oh, don't do this, do this. You know, I, I love rules. I was like a rule collector, you know, and it's like, but as you go on, and my students ask me now, and I say, I don't know. My only North Star is surprise. Mm. And, and, and there's it comes with a little bit more courage. You know, like when I first started, I said, oh, God, what's this? I found something in the line, and it's kind of freaking me out. I don't know if I'm supposed to do this. I don't know if this is what writers should say. And I would kind of uh, almost like you peeking into the abyss, and then you close it. And I think as you do it, and maybe, you know, this is true of acting too, where, where the more you do it, you look in a little more and you said, okay, I think I can take a longer look. And that courage allows you to kind of look without judgment. And I think this is what Buddhism teaches me, you know, is that you can, the act of looking is inexhaustible, that there, there is no du dualism in it. You know, um, you can look at the same thing when you're 20, look at it again when you're 35, and it's a completely different thing, including books. And I love that you talked about that, that uh, multi-genre, multidisciplinary youth, because I think that is how we should embody. I think it, it's being a, an educator, one of the big drawbacks of the professionalization of creativity is that everyone has to stay in their lane. You know, my students greet each other by saying, what are you? And you would say fiction or poetry in the NYU program, you know? And, uh, but one of my, my favorite, you know, my favorite filmmaker, Chris Marker's poet, uh, Gordon Parks, photographer, poet, fiction writer, you know, so many things. And uh, it's really beautiful to see. And you see all that. I think, I think that's why when this book you know, you, you read it, it lifts off the page with a kind of lived life and that, that in a way it doesn't feel like a debut. It feels like a really considered way of elocution. And uh, I was just so impressed by that. And of course, it makes sense that you've been thinking about this for so many decades. Yeah. Um, thank you. I mean, it, it, it's... Um when you are an actor or do or, or anything else and you do something else it sometimes there's a lot of baggage that you bring with it and you have to let go of what people are going to say and the judgment because it, it it can be i think it's smart what you said about your students and talking to them about it and not being so pigeonholed into one thing or another it's like well how does it feel to be an actor who's trying to write a book or going to write a book it's like rather than, well, I'm a person who acts. It's not like actor is this species <laughs> that just does this. I do, a lot of, uh, I do a lot of other things besides act, some of which are not artistic at all, you know. Um, it's, not, it's not something that really limits you. But I understand, I understand the, the baggage. When you come from something that gets a lot of notoriety and people kind of recognize you as that, you know, their perception is sometimes uh, it's fixed in a certain way. Um, and it's so reductive, you know, it's yeah. so narrow. Yes. And I get the same in a very different way where uh, people assume that I wrote a novel to make money. Really? <laughs> And look, I know many novelists. That's a bad way to want it to, to you know. I, know. I know many novelists who, for which um, multiple books, and they're still, you know, uh, down in the dumps financially. And so it, it's not exactly, you know, but it's interesting that presumption is that, oh, if you're, why would a poet want to write a novel, you know? And then regardless of this rich history of hybridity, you know, Thomas Hardy wrote novels just so he can write poems. 
Melville wrote more lines of poetry than Whitman and Dickinson combined. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Jimmy Bal Baldwin, you know, Jimmy's Blues, you know, uh, Margaret Atwood, Joyce Carol Oates. And, but I think this modern idea that you are a fix into a kind of category and if you break out of it it's suspicious yes right is he bored with acting is this a side job right uh is is the poetry not enough right and so we we want our artists to be innovative but we also want them to be tamed and yeah. just, and again i think maybe between us buddhism has a really central role in this because it, it shows it reminds me that the ego this form is part of a dreamscape that I, I I'm free to divest myself of the labels people put on me knowing yeah. that that's a projection of them and I just do I just follow the curiosity and for me I said to my you know I wrote I wrote a book of poems and I was really fortunate that it kind of took off in the small poetry way and it freaked me out I was I was 27. Um, and I just wanted a book to show my mom that I didn't waste my life. You know, I said, you know, my first book, I was so shy. I didn't, I didn't have um, an author photo in the back. I just, I just, I, you know, my hero was Emily Dickens. I said, I just want a book. And then just, I could just hide. And I told my mom, I said, Ma, I got a book. It's coming out. And uh, she's passed now. But I remember her saying, are you going to put the photo in the back? And I said, I, I wasn't, th I was, I wasn't going to, you know, she said, you, you, you have to put the photo back. Otherwise <laughs> I can't brag to my clients at the nail salon. They won't believe that my son is an author unless I can show them the back of the book and the photo on my phone. So that's why the, my first book is a photo of me in a white, in a, a tank top in an overheated Astoria apartment. Um, and it, it looks so unprofessional. I just, my friend snapped it. And, but now it's like, cool. Everyone's wow. What a, what a edgy author photo, <laughs> but it was just satisfying, you know, um, mama. Um, but it, it's so That's interesting true. how things uh, accrue. Um, but I'm, yeah. you talked about acting and I think I keep thinking about the, this Aristotle's, you know, belief that art is mimesis. It's mimetic of life that that the great and then Henry James picks this up right and I think we we're still kind of especially in the realm of modern realism we're in kind of this Henry James shadow where he says the best fiction mimics life to a T right that's the marker and we've had kind of um, antithetical approaches to this since then but that's kind of kind of the dominant thing where people, a reader would say I don't believe this it's not cohesive or I don't buy it right. Um, but I think if I when, I when I go down at it, at the core, what I do is a kind of miming that I think actors do um, in a very different way. It's less embodied, but it's in speech. Like, I, I'm just a really good mimic. Like, you know, I won't, among my friends, you know, I can like, and I'm like, I'm learning that some of the best artists just absorb. I think we're yeah. kind of chameleons in this way. And if we were to boil it down, I would say what you're doing is miming the human conditions in different forms. And you've been doing it. This is just a, a manifestation, go back to Buddhist ideas. This that is makes a, sense. a material manifestation of what you've already been doing. Because I feel like that too. And I'm no actor, but sometimes I feel like I really have to like embody. And sometimes I would get up and walk around the room and try to speak like this character just to get the cadence right. You know, how would this speech fall? Right. Should I drop the S's? Should I drop, you know, is it really a, does this person ask a question about the question mark? Right. It's one of the, some things I always ask about. Like, it, it's That's what you do as an actor. Yeah. Because yeah. it's all imagination. I mean, whether it's acting, you know, or literature or screenwriting, whatever, ultimately it's all work, imaginative work, right? Even if you're working out of life, life as a model, you're still kind of, translating it through your imagination so you know you're imagining how this it's the same thing that an actor does when you read a script you're imagine you know that say there's a role that you're going to play when you read it your imagination just automatically goes to work and starts to picture well how you're going to move how you're going to say that word how you're going to look at that other person it's the same exact thing i mean do you um 
write from a picture in your mind and then try to capture that? Do you, is that, is that part of that process? Yeah. Yeah. I write very slowly and I think um, it's interesting. A lot of uh, filmmakers have talked to me, said this film, this book uh, is very cinematic mm -hmm. and um, I, I, I take their word for it. I didn't think much of it, but I do think in scenes. And I think for me, I would kind of just keep a scene in my head for months and just how does the light fall? What is the time of day? What's the mood? And I will start to animate it in my head, just kind of imagine that world. And when it comes time to write it, it's almost like it's a memory. You trick your mind. And I'm like, wait a minute, did I live this? No, 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 no. This is my novel. I didn't live this, you know. I'm adding to it as I go. And every day you put a little more detail in it. So, and and ultimately, everything you imagine won't end up in the book, but the writing flows. There's there's not kind of very little stuckness. And so I I, I don't believe in writer's block. I, I think, well, blockness is a kind of relativity, blocked according to whom. Maybe you just need to dream a little more right. and then it'll come. Um, but yeah, I, I, I work in, in, in that um, strange way that where most of it is in the head and the writing is kind of like the residue. I must say, I, 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 I wrote the, uh, the script for the novel's adaptation. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. Really? It, it was the most, hands down, I don't think I have it in me to do another one. Um, I'm doing that now too. Right now, yeah, you have a stand. You you know, as an artist, you have a standard, and you and you work and develop that for many years, and then you kind of find the ability to meet that standard. And I would say that I was very happy with what I've done, but the cost it took to meet that was way beyond me. I just it did not come natural, but I'm very very pleased with it, and you know, a twenty four liked it. But it was so challenging, just as you said, because you're working on a blueprint. And not only that, but you have to write poorly, but usefully. Yeah. Man. And, and within, within five minutes, scene's over. Whereas in the novel, I get to, you know, a scene you can, yeah. you kind of sink in. Well, here it's like he, he opens the door, sits down. I'm like, oh, now what? Jesus. You know, one page and I'm I'm on the floor with the script. Yeah, it's it's a different thing because you have to let you have to let the image do a lot of the work yeah. rather than the word like a novel is all words. I mean, making the images, they, the words do all, all the work. And in the in the script, it's like you have to rely on the the image and, and what that conveys. The first I just been working on the screenplay adaptation of this and the first draft was so long uh i'm working with another writer which is good uh, someone i've worked with for a long time you know and my book is first person right narration so i had a lot of that in there and i overwrought it because i want i wanted to turn it over to my writing partner and just say just go nuts hmm. in the editing of this because i knew it was too much but I, I i just wanted another set of eyes to help me figure out what to take out what's not needed what Image, what the image is going to do uh, to cancel, you know, will inform how many words, you know, what words you can take out. You know what I mean? I you don't to need learn. to be redundant, right? At which yeah, yeah, I had to, to cut back so much dialogue. You realize the most powerful moment in the script is when questions aren't answered. So you don't, you avoid that sort of ping pong dialogue. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then sometimes it's just, he looked at it and then you, you have to trust the actor to know. And that was, it took a long time for me to be able to get to that place. And, I, and when I, once it clicked, it's like a different rhythm and you're like, okay, but you're kind of, um, you're writing towards future phantoms. Yes. Nothing, none of it exists. It's just yeah. a sketch. And so you're kind of out of your mind. It, I was listening, Kurosawa had a wonderful tip for script writing. He says, um, when you're climbing the mountain, never look at the top. Just look at the bottom. Just look at your feet. One page a day. One page a day. It was so so helpful. Um, mm -hmm. But can I ask a question about um, one of my favorite scenes in your book, and one of my favorite scenes may maybe I've ever read, 
is when the mother massages the ghost limb of the woman. I thought there was something, you know, compassion compassion just radiates in your book uh, from the point of view. Uh, There's a lot of compassion for all the characters and thus for all of humanity in a way. Uh, And that scene, um, you know, both from the mother who's doing it, you know, who's massaging it and the, the woman who asks for it, and the connection they have as a result of that is so beautiful, interesting, unique, um, and says a million things in that that little moment there. Is that oh. is that in the movie? Yeah, yeah. Is it yeah. Good. I'm, 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 I was proud proud of that scene. You know, one of my and I, you know what, I feel the same in your book. It's so interesting that we were probably working on these books at the same time. I started my book uh, in 2016, summer 2016, and uh, handed it in uh, in uh, February uh, uh, 2019, final draft. And what I loved about this book, and, and I had such kinship with that, was that there were no villains and no victims. And mm-hmm. it kind of goes against both Freytag's triangle and the Western narratology of man versus whatever, right? Man versus world, man versus nature, man versus self. And I and I think it, it kind of elides that in such a smart way. And that was my one goal. And and I would say that being a poet helped me do that because I had to go up against so much of this junk the culture was telling me that. If you have a character, the character must fight something to make their lives worthwhile. And I thought, I think, what if I can just position friction and tension? Because I believe that life is tension. Life is dukkha. Life is samsara. And so again, the Buddhism philosophy pervades. And I said, I, I, I think I can just place people with context side by side. And that might be enough. I don't need a hero's journey. I don't need an antagonist that has to be defeated. And I think if I did believe that, I would not have a scene like that, where it's absolutely, there's a power exchange, but as far as morality, they're absolutely neutral. Um, and that, that interests me in your book as well, this, this relationship with Lou Reed, the Lou character, and also the Bildungsroman. No. You know, at the end, he ends up kind of like losing his mind, right? And I think the traditional American building Roman is that you're ejected into adulthood, whether you finish high school or college, or you get married, right? So you kind of switch that archetype on its head. And I was just so impressed about that. Could you talk a little bit about like your relationship with the coming of age story? Well, I mean, Catcher in the Rye was when I was a kid. You know, everybody read it, but it it, re- it made a gigantic impression because there was something in the voice of that character that I understood. I understood the way he looked at the world. Um, that and Candide, that was another one that was a really big one for me as a teenager. I think I was 14 when I read it. And it's the voice of that character stayed with me for so long. You know, that kind of optimism at all this horror that was going on around him and in his in his world as well um you know i mean candide's a lot more satirical but there was there was something to that voice that really always stuck in my head those two books stayed in my head even i didn't read them for years and years and years but when i started this book i started it from a third person and i found i couldn't find my way in it just was way too broad of a point of view and it was beyond my ability at the time to really figure out how to how how to approach it from that angle. What do I keep in? What do I include? Like you said, when you think of a scene, what's the light like? What's the colors like? What's the temp? Well, it was just too overwhelming of, of a scope. And once I started writing it in like a di- diary form, it started to flow. Like I was, oh, okay. And then it's you realize that it's kind of enough. Um, 
You don't have to tell everything. You're just telling, you know, it's as if you're sitting down with someone and they're telling you a story, right? You're going to hear what they're telling you. They're not going to tell you every single detail in the room. They're going to tell you things that give you enough of a picture. Um, uh, and as far as the, the thing about no victims and no villains, my favorite filmmaker is John Cassavetes. And what I found about his films, which really blow my mind about it, is that the same thing. There's no villains in his movies. There's just people trying to live their lives. You know, sometimes they do, you know, not so nice things things that can be considered wrong or bad or whatever, but it's, I felt as a, as a filmmaker, as an artist, he looked at his characters with a lot of compassion. He never judged them. He never, he never kind of had some, had the attitude that he was smarter than them and looking down on them. He kind of just said, this is what I'm seeing. I'm not asked, you can judge them how you want, but I'm not really judging them. Yeah. Wow. That's so brilliant. I, I love that you said that. One of my, my favorite filmmakers are the Dardenne brothers for the same reason. Um, and of course, Tarkovsky's The Mirror. Um, That's a beautiful one. The Mirror is. Oh it's a poem, right? It, 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 yeah. at, that film gave me a lot of permission in my novel. I it was inspired in part the form because yeah. I was reading these weird, you know, hybrid poets, uh, you know, uh, Ann Carson's Hero of Mine, Bono Capillo, Juna Barnes, these kind of like marginal texts in many ways. Um, and, uh, but I didn't really have like, the, had the courage to, to pull it off until I saw Tarkovsky and I said, oh, you don't have to transition. You don't have to build all the bridges. In fact, as a poet, I knew that. I knew that the stanza break, the line break is a site where the reader can participate, but I needed a more linear form. And it was that film that really got me to, to commit to that. And I wrote on earth in all three points of view, first, second, and third, um, because I, but I had the same hesitation with the third. And I think when I was watch reading models of the third, which is like a traditional Tolstoyan omniscient third, it felt like there was too much judgment on the characters. I, I just felt like it was a slimy voice to me. It was too, the authority didn't, didn't sit well with me because you had to keep rendering and then judging the characters. Um, and so I had to find a different way uh, of, of going about it. It's actually Dara is very helpful. You quoted Dara's The Lover. Now that book has third and first. Right. So she talks about the sex scenes. She jumps to the third, the girl, right? The girl and the Chinaman, you know, quote unquote. And I, again, that book too is, is, a, is a long poem. And that book is very similar to Tarkovsky's The Mirror. Yes. With the leaps, it's all scene build, vignettes. Um, uh, so it's so exciting when I saw Dara coming through. What, is, what did Dara mean to you? Like, why start this book with this quote? Well, I mean, uh, that, that quote, that quote um, I think I was reading The Lover for the second time during, during right, but that quote, I've known you for years, everyone says, you were beautiful when you were young, but I want to tell you, I think you're more beautiful now than then. Rather than your face as a young woman, I prefer your face as it is now, ravaged. Um, something about, you know, survival and 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 moving through time that being beautiful that as is as much a part of our of our beauty as the physical you know yeah. sense yeah. and maybe more so um and it's the word ravage that makes that right. Right. It, it no and that's what makes it yeah talk how about do you say it in french ravaged yeah it's just incredible i mean I it's, it's like time ravages mm -hmm. we know that but it's hard to find the context to say it. Um, and when someone says it like that in, in one, one, one sentence, right? It's, it's its own yeah. sentence. Um, what, a, what a brilliant leap of faith that is. Uh, so are there more novels in your, under your belt? Um, will you do the third person eventually? I'm working on something that I started a little while ago and then put down a little bit and then picked up again. Some, sometimes things... Um, have like an incubation 
period where you need to let them ferment. Oh, but it's not, it, it, it's, uh, it's first and little sections of third, actually. Yes. Did you, I wanted to ask you about that. Like, how did you, did you outline your book? Like, did you have a structure in mind when you started or did it just kind of like evolve as you went? Uh, meticulous outlining. Um, really? I just didn't know how it would be sequenced. That came at the end. Um, and I learned that writing a book of poems, you know, at, at the end of the a collection of poems, you put everything on the wall. And I had a long hallway in a story. I was very lucky. I was in the back apartment. And so I had this long, it was all it was, was a hallway. There's nothing else. It was just, and so I put, I taped it and walked back. And I learned how to sequence. It helped me write the novel in many ways. Um, but I had kind of, I mean, in, in screenwriting, I guess you call it reverse engineering. I think that's true. You know, I had kind of these objectives. Okay. Uh, build the, build this scene of tender around tenderness with these two boys. Um, how do we bring out, you know, Trevor's personhood, right? One, one of my great interests with, with the Trevor character was, okay, you're in a system of this very dark Americana hyper-masculine conservative system, but what if you don't belong there? And then my question for myself, what's the cost of a boy refuting his inheritance, his cultural inheritance, right? And that's a kind of weight that the little dog character didn't have to. And I wanted to show that the immigrant story was not just all pain and suffering and dooming. In fact, little dog's character in relation to his sexuality was much more advantageous than Trevor. Trevor was up against, you know, something that would ultimately kill him. He didn't have the tools, right? Mm -hmm. You're supposed to think of this all American boy was supposed to have everything, but he, he didn't. And I wanted to show that they were both defunct and um, deprived in their own way, but it was the queerness that made them question what they were given. It was the queerness that gave them this wonderment in their life. Um, so there you go. I just told you like a kind of thesis. And so I said, all right, how, how do we uh, use mimesis? How do we dramatize these characters so that they can do this? And so I made them sit on a shed eat, sharing a peach or sharing a grapefruit. And then they talk about the sunset, which is this a perfect kind of way to have two people from two different worlds looking at the same thing which is both illuminating them, but also descending. It's, it's losing, you know, the light. Um, so I would do this with various chapters. And then at the end, I had all these pieces and sometimes I bridged them. Um, it was really helpful learning and, and just finding small, you could do a deft touch, you know, uh, three weeks after, three weeks after the shed. And then you can, you can hinge it so that the reader's like, all right, this is part of a scope of a life, even though it's really fragmented. Right. But that's one way, you know, there's so many, so many ways, but yeah, it's, it's, a, you don't know. I think if you sit down and say, I'm going to write this book, boy, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I've given up that. So yeah. <laughs> I have a little trick with my students. Uh, I'm going to out myself now, but uh, halfway through the semester, I tell them, all right, everybody next week, uh, write a love poem come back and show us your love poem. And I can, I go home and I can feel the torture in the air coming through me, you know? And they come back and their faces is just blank and, and no one could really do it to their satisfaction. It's like, it's not easy, right? And in a way you shouldn't do that. You, you shouldn't sit down to do X, Y, Z. I think following your curiosity. Yeah. Um, is, I mean, the jazz musicians figured it out, didn't they? I mean, it's just like an improv, yeah. right? I think um, basic structure, basic North Stars, and then improv. I mean, Murakami takes us to an extreme. He says, I have no outline. I sit down and then I follow the thread until it's done. And for him, it's 700 pages, right? But he says he's hugely influenced by, you know, Duke Ellington and Miles Davis and he just does this kind of absolute um, freestyle. Exactly. And I can't do that. I need some kind of structure. But I, my structure, my freestyle is kind of contained in cells. 
Right. Yeah. And it's like, it's I work like, that same way. I didn't outline, but I have kind of like tent poles that I kind of know along the way. Paul Oster said something really interesting as I asked him the same question. He said, no, I don't outline. I just kind of start with a little germ. And then as I go, constellations start to form, which I love that. I thought that was very kind of beautiful. Um, and sometimes that germ is just a good line. You know, yeah. Sometimes a good line yeah. is like, God, yeah. who is this? Yeah. And then try it all out. Okay, does the mother say this? All right, that's nice. Does the son say this? And then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, my God. The white farm boy says this mm. after this scene, right? So you're kind of just throwing words in people's mouths and uh, you're seeing if it sticks, you know? And so that's why it's the most humbling thing. You know, it, it's very uncomfortable for me. Um, I joke with my friends and my family. I said, you know, I think technically everything I've done is overrated. <laughs> I don't believe in anything what anyone said. You know, all the reviews and when they're very kind, is but I'm like, I think that's kind of overrated. Like I don't, I don't think it's that it does that. You know, because you're working with a, such a fragile material, one comma and the whole thing falls apart. It's so humbling. You rarely feel like a hero of anything, let alone an author. Um, but when it clicks, boy. It's like it, it, it always should have been like the word ravage in that dura. It's like, oh, there's no other word, you know, and you just stumble upon that. Or when you surprise yourself in the midst of writing and like all of a sudden, like a, an image comes, a scene or a, a line or a sentence and that, that you had no preconception of and it comes and it's there. That's really that's that's one of the most high. I've been yeah. when that happened. You know, that's quite a quite a, a rush. Does you know? your meditation practice help you become attuned to that? Um, I think a byproduct of meditation, because for me, from my, you know, my Buddhist practice point of view, meditation is really about working with the mind to so you can ultimately better be better for other people. Right. <laughs> um, and be a more compassionate human being and things. But I think a byproduct of it is improved concentration. But I don't, I don't, like I teach meditation, but I don't really talk about that. I, I teach meditation online, but I don't talk about that because I don't, I don't want people to think I'm going to just meditate so I can concentrate because it's really, there's so much more it's it's a lot more precious than that you know the the reasons to 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 work with the mind that way but yeah, yeah i think it does help concentration yeah and focus. Well, i was i was meditating before i became a writer and so i can't tell i can't tell you how much right. it was just a part of my life i can't tell you um but i've noticed that i'm just more awake and i'm i've turned we talked we, we began this segment talking about doubt and I think I've made doubt useful. Mm -hmm. and it helps me make doubt useful. I'm like, oh, what is that thought? And I'm, I'm like, okay, well, just let it be. It's right. there. It's spotless. Watch it. Let's let it, and then it'll fade. And then I said, oh, what if I did that with everything else in life? Um, feelings, emotion. And after a while, uh, I think it helps the writer because you don't get the simple answer. You're you're skeptical of it. It's like, oh, what? Is, maybe this character should just do this. And I was like, well, is there more to them? You know, are there other angles? Which is meditation for me helps right. me see everything from different angles. And you step, you think, you look at something for a while, and then, you know, even just two minutes, it's completely different. A feeling, an emotion, resentment, anger, you know, even joy, pleasure. It just complete. It's like so mercurial. And right. oblique, um, that you know, it's it's weird that what we do is fix things. I, I feel like writing is akin to nailing things, right? <laughs> if I had another shot at at these books, man, I would go to town, you know. But nothing else would happen. But I think we fossilize the ideas. That's true. I world. 
I hate to interrupt Michael and Ocean, this extraordinary conversation, but if writing is about doubt and following your curiosity, I hope you won't mind too much if I invite you into the curiosity of the audience and ask you a couple of their questions at this point. Sure. Thank you so much for this evening so far. We've we've been told already by the audience how life-changing this discussion is. So no pressure on these answers at all. Um, Ocean, the first question that I've got, um, we'll start with you, but Michael, it'd be great to hear your thoughts as well. Um, it, it, it goes, hi, Ocean, I've heard you speak previously about how you found your way to poetry through attending your friend's punk concerts. And I wanted to ask if you're still into that scene, who are your favourite punk bands of the moment? Oh, my God. Great question. Um, yes, I was a community college student and uh, I I. I didn't have a, a car, uh, so I rode my bike, rain or shine, and through snowstorms. Um, and um, my friends felt really bad for me, so they said, "We can give you a ride home, but we, we're in a punk band. You got to come to the practice." I loved punk music. Um, in my day, that was anti-flag, this kind of hyper-political. I was in Food Not Bombs. I was very active in, you know, organizing communities, veganism. Um, and so they uh, they brought me to the practice and I, I would just kind of sit there and look at their bookshelves, all these radical pamphlets, you know, it was like the, it was a perfect place to be for a, a young mind. And uh, one day I saw on the, the, the coffee table, a printout of Rambo's Le Bateau Eve, The Drunken Boat. And it's in, written in French rhyming quatrains. It, it was translated into English, but it was still in quatrains. And so it sounded like lyrics. So I said, when is, what band is he in? Um, I, we, I wanna go see his band. And they said, no, he's been dead 150 years. Um, but he inspired Patti Smith, Jim Morrison and, and this gritty New York scene that we really love. And it kind of blew my mind, um, but, uh, punk music was kind of the ethos that I was introduced to literature. I think I I'm really lucky, I must say, because of that, because it began with the premise that literature has to break away from what was being given to us through conformity and the shock. And I grew up, you know, at that time it was Bush era, Iraq, Afghanistan, 9-11, terror and fear threats were color-coded every day, orange, yellow, red. Um, and so there was this hyper xenophobia um, that I was, that was when I was coming of age at that time. And uh, so I, I went to these, uh, so if, if I had a traditional um, American canonical education, it would be Frost, you know, Stafford, all the Roberts, I love them well enough, you know, um, Robert Bly, Robert Duncan, um, Robert Lowell, they're all great. I love them, but I didn't have that. I had Rambeau and it was immediately this suspicion, um, but also this intense hope that an optimism that language should disrupt first and foremost, um, that the, the received forms have to be questioned. And from there, I went to the library and I found it was Dewey Decimal. So I was in France and I was amongst the surrealists. So from there, I went to Baudelaire, Breton, Aimé Césaire, Glissant, and then the French Caribbean theorist. Um, that was my literary education. And I, I'm, I feel really thankful for that because I never had to kind of turn from what, what Bloom would call this uh, in, anxiety of influence, this patrilineal, uh, American ethos. I just, I was lucky enough to just not be a part of that um, through, through punk music. Mm. That's, that's wonderful. I'm, I'm sort of leading on from that. I'm going to move to our final audience question with my eyes on the clock uh, that, that leads on from that sort of sense of disruption, perhaps. Um, Michael, I'm going to ask you first, has language lost its power in a world where we all have numerous tools and avenues to to voice our views and opinions, or is it more powerful than ever? What's the responsibility of language in the modern world? Um, I don't think it's lost its power at all. Um, 
you know, language is is a tool of communication. Um, when we're talking about fiction, you know, it's the sentence is the you know component of a book, right? Each you know that's what it's made up of. There's there's nothing else there. I mean, the we're all here today because of you know two books that came out and and um, somehow uh, the people watching and joining us connected to one or the other or both um, because of of uh, language. Um, I, I think it's changed just because there's so many different mediums people uh, receive language. It's not just through a book and it's not just through the telephone. Now it's through, you know, social media and many form m many forms of media itself, news media and, you know, cultural media. Um, I think in the end, an honest reflection and communication of, of a specific human experience, an authentic human experience always uh, has the potential to strike a chord. And um, I think it was David Foster Wallace maybe that I heard said, you know, literature ultimately is to make each other, uh, to make us feel less lonely. That was one of his quotes or opinions. And Ker Kerouac kind of said a similar thing, and I, I, I feel that as well. You know, not only literature, but you know the the great musicians that I, you know, that that and and artists that really inspired me, filmmakers and stuff. It made me feel less alone in the world. You know, it made me feel like there are people who maybe think like I do, and and gave gave me some hope. Thank you, thank you both so much. Um... I know that this has been a, a magical conversation for us all to be part of and uh, the generosity of of this discussion has made us all feel like we were part of it. So thank you both so much. Um, to wrap up, um, we're going to invite you both to, to see us out with a reading. So I may start with you, Michael, and then Ocean, if you want to pick up straight away afterwards. Um, that should see us through our days pretty nicely. Thank you both so much uh, for joining us. Thank you. Okay, I'm reading that this is like the epilogue of the book, which happens, most of the book is a coming of age in the mid seventies in New York. And this happens many years later um, in 2013. I'm heading up the 101 with Los Angeles behind me. I think it's autumn, it's night, so it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell in the daytime too. The sun has no seasons in Southern California, or maybe it does and I just haven't figured them out yet. On the edge of Thousand Oaks, I find myself at the top of the Conejo grade. It's a dizzying decline that twists down into the valley where Camarillo begins. If you didn't know any better, you could easily think you were about to fall off the edge of the world. This stretch of Cali freeway is supposedly haunted by the ghost of a hitchhiking migrant farm worker who was run over by a drunken teenager who hung himself in his jail cell, which I suppose makes two ghosts, though it's only the farmhand who's been seen in these parts. And though I have no idea where in the Los Angeles area my father crashed and burned, something in my gut tells me it was here. I'm sure there are ways to research it and find out the truth, but I've yet to do so and probably never will. Sometimes the truth of imagination is easier to live with than the truth of fact. By day, you can see hills rolling on for miles, some of them strange and mysterious, like, fl like flat top pyramids grown over wild, too correct in angle and line to be a product of nature. At night, it's like sitting in the cockpit of an airplane as you slowly descend to a narrow landing strip between the mountains, hills, farmland, and the lights of the Camerians. Depending on which way the wind is blowing, you might get a heady waft of peaty fertilizer or sugary strawberry if luck is with you. But tonight the air is still. One of your songs comes on the radio. You are only a few days dead, so a lot of your songs are being sent over the airwaves. It's an old song, one of your earliest, a nugget that would spawn so many more of its kind as an unbroken chain of admirers fell under your influence. It's a tender tune, a sad, slow song, sweet and delicate. Something churns in my solar plexus and threatens release through the eyes 
it catches me by surprise. Then it breaks and the tears come. Big drops that fall out easily. They drip like wax, sealing all the oaths and pledges. It feels good. I go from surprise to shock when I notice it's raining. It hasn't rained here in years, but the sky doesn't know that, so it sends the water down as if it were common. It pours like the tropics, and it's very hard to see. Dangerous. West Coast drivers are unaccustomed to wet roads and impaired visibility. We all slow to a steady creep, some of us crying. I cry as much for your passing as I do for the time unrecoverable that has passed me by. I cry for the boy I was who became a man, for the city I love, which has vanished like you have, for the beautiful, brilliant shooting star who left this earth while still a child. I cry for never, never having known you once I was old enough to understand who you really were and the magnitude of the art you made. The story told here, closing with me on the edge of manhood, is as much yours as it is mine. Its end is where we parted, and it would be at least 15 years until I'd see you again. The song ends and the tears stop as suddenly as they started. Another song of yours begins to play. It's the one that got me into all that trouble. You played it one night at the knitting factory, a miracle really, because I loved it so much and it was rarely included in your live repertoire. It was sheer delight that evening and maybe even more thrilling tonight. It opens with a wail, your guitar, then it churns and rumbles, bass and drums, then melts euphoric, more guitar, then you shout. It is heroic and brave, transcendent and holy, and it doesn't look like the rain will stop. I hit the gas hard and head into the West. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much everyone for, for being here. And uh, thank you, Michael, for writing an extraordinary book and for lending his mind and heart to us this evening. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read a poem from uh, Time as a Mother. Um, and this is kind of a, in the Latin, there's this kind of a subgenre called Ars Poetica. Uh, and so poets uh, have been for thousands of years uh, been called upon to defend their art or put a, a raison d'etre for it. Um, it's a wonderful kind of assignment we have. And it actually would be interesting if more artists uh, had to articulate the defense of their art. It'd be interesting to hear. Um, but this poem functions as a, a kind of ours poetic. It's called The Bull. He stood alone in the backyard, so dark the night purpled around him. I had no choice. I opened the door and stepped out wind in the branches. He watched me with kerosene blue eyes. What do you want? I asked, forgetting I had no language. He kept breathing to stay alive. I was a boy, which meant I was a murderer of my childhood. And like all murderers, my God was stillness. My God, he was still there, like something prayed for by a man with no mouth. The green blue lamp swirled in its socket. I didn't want him. I didn't want him to be beautiful, but needing beauty to be more than hurt, gentle enough to hold. I reached for him. I reached, not the bull, but the depths. Not an answer, but an entrance, the shape of an animal. That was lovely, lovely. I like, I like the way you read too. It's really very much like an actor. Oh, thank you. Well, that, that's, the, that's the beginning and the end of my acting career. <laughs> I'll leave the rest. I don't know of you. about that. I think you should rethink that, maybe. I'll, I'll leave. I'll leave the rest to you, Michael. But I, want, <laughs> I want more books from you, though. So. Okay. <laughs> and you. Thank you. As well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you both so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you.
thank you so much. That was 